Let's use this as an example. So DocuSign's vision is to build a DocuSign Global Trust Network. I actually took a play out of Ariba, and that is an open network that creates fast, frictionless transactions universally translated uh, around the world. And uh, uh, because when you build that network effect, uh, then virality kicks in, you get leverage in your business model. So that's the vision, I'll show you where we're at. The mission is to be this global standard in digital transaction management. So here's, you know, here's another uh, example of creating a category from scratch. Well, you know, our name, DocuSign, has now become a verb. We do way more than e-signature. That's about five part of what, uh, uh, five percent of what we do. So, we're sitting around. And we go. We got to name this category: digital transaction management. Now, you know, I was introduced by the CEO of Deutsche Bank the other day to speak at their tech conference, and the way he introduced me was: DocuSign is the clear leader for perhaps the most strategic and potentially the largest category <laughs> in the cloud today, digital transaction management. So now you got that. By the way, and fancy word for being a leader, if you're like 10x the next guy, which we are, that's a global standard. And by the way, in this market that's so huge, this is a land grab and it's winner take all. So that's the mission. The values, right? That's with Cordia, customer focus. And when we, the way we describe that at DocuSign, we measure our success by our customer success. We use their metrics. And by the way, the ROI is so quantifiable. Uh, we improve the customer experience and we do risk in terms of uh, security and compliance. Passion, right? People could deny your logic, but they cannot deny your enthusiasm. And you know, with that passion also goes uh, some fun and a sense of humor. Uh, integrity. You know, we take things right to the edge in terms of the prototypes we build, in terms of experiments in the field. But when it comes to running our financial books or how we treat people or our ethics, we don't even go close to the edge. We call it beyond reproach. And there's been so many great companies that have lost their way because of that simple word, integrity. And that means everything. And by the way, that's one of those lessons I learned at Kronos. Innovation. By the way, in this business, you either innovate or you die. You change or you die. And that's the most powerful word in any, uh, any language, change, because without that, you don't develop, prosper, or grow. Um, executional excellence, bad execution, man. That's there all the time. And we, the way we talk about it is perfect the perfectible. Just keep, because there's enough uh, variables uh, in terms of building a company that anything you can control, man, you want to control them. So those are those uh, core values. Now, that's nice right up there. So how do you kind of make them come alive? We do that through what we affectionately call our team rules. So we have five team rule rules. Direct, open, and honest communication. In a word, that means the truth. So I saw some of your questions. Some of the questions uh, you guys wrote down was, what did, I, what, what did I learn at General Motors? Let me tell you another thing I learned at General Motors was my first job, I was a production foreman, second shift, 19 years old, at the only Cadillac plant uh, in the world. It was a whole plant. Um, and back then, Cadillac was the top. It was the standard of the world. And about 50% of those cars coming off the line had to go in the repair bins. So it was just horrible, horrible quality. Now, the guy who was my supervisor, he let me watch it go up the chain. So then, you know, uh, I, I, you know I'd report out to him. And then I would see how he would take it. He goes, oh, man, our quality's not good. Then I would see it go up to the plant superintendent. <coughs> they go, well, we got these five problems in the quality here. Then I see it go to the superintendent, the VP of manufacturing. He goes, man, we have this one thing we're working on. you know." And then it would go up to the general manager of Cadillac. It's like, OK, everything's OK. Now that next summer, then I worked in the New York Treasurer's Office where the board of directors uh, meets as a staff guy to the, to the board. Actually, my boss back then, who was four years older than me, ended up being the CEO of General Motors for 10 years, Rick Wagner. But now I could see what happens when it goes, you know, to general manager, to senior VP. Senior VP, oh, you know, our quality is great. 
goes up the EVP, you know, just couldn't be better. Then it goes up to the board. We have no competition. So what I learned is, man, you need that truth. And the only time, uh, you know, I get upset as a CEO, these guys can vouch for that, is if uh, there's a surprise, right? You know, surprises are for birthdays. You got to get that truth out. Direct, open, and honest communication. Second thing is create that safe environment. No idea is a bad idea. Because out of that comes a lot of creativity. Now we put parentheses uh, right next to that, and it says, unless it's the CEOs. Because it's open season to mock out the CEO. I mean, that makes it fun. That actually makes a safe environment. Third, <laughs> raise the standard in everything we do, of course. Fourth, we're functional. Uh, 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 we're a team first, functional specialist second. So for everybody, think with your CEO hat on. So you product developer guys, put your feet in the customer's shoes. You sales guys, don't make commitments to the customers you can't keep. So it's all about uh, putting the team first. And then the fifth one, which is my favorite one, which is the most important one, hire the best people, especially if they're better than us. I'll tell you a story about uh, another early day uh, at Ariba. I think uh, we had about 50 people in the company. I don't know, we've been going about six months. And we would always have a round table every Friday, company meeting. And, uh, you know, I'd say a few things. We'd show them, something like that. But everybody got to go around and say whatever they wanted. And I'll never forget one of the founders. He was a VP of uh, marketing. Bobby Lint stands up and he goes, oh, my God. This opportunity is bigger than I imagined. This company is going to be so successful, it's unbelievable. Citing team rule number five, I think I should step aside. Just focus on strategic alliances, and we got to go out and hire a real world-class VP of marketing. And you can just see the, the jaws drop. And I'll never forget the guy sitting next to him. His name was uh, Guy Haskins. He was about 23 years old. And he just looks at Bobby and he goes, you know, I just came from a software company that's going to go bankrupt any day. But if one of the guys would have had the courage to say what you just did, this thing could have gone to the moon. So ever since that moment, it became noble. It became noble to hire the best people, especially if they're better than us. And then I had another founder, this guy, Rob DeSanta. He was running sales. He, and this is probably about a year in or so. And he's... He's got probably 20 sales guys working for him. And he goes, Croc, he goes, I think, uh, I think we ought to go uh, hire somebody else. Uh, I'm going, Rob, man, you're, I mean, you just closed like a $5 million deal at FedEx, $3 million Bristol Myers Squibb. I mean, you're, no, he goes, I'm more of a startup guy. Why don't I go over to Amsterdam and run that same play I did at Rasnet, and we'll open up our European office. And I'm like, yeah, right, who are you going to hire? He goes, well, maybe like the VP of North American sales for SAP. I go, great, all right. You hire that guy, then uh, you can go to Europe. He goes, okay, now, can I have an application engineer and a secretary? Okay, fine. And he goes, and only a, a $2 million quota? I go, okay, that's fine. Comes back a month later, VP of North American sales from SAP, a guy named Paul Melchiori that uh, took us totally to the next level. So Rob's over there in uh, Europe. I call him every morning as I'm driving in. Rob, how you doing, man? How you doing? Oh, yeah, I've got a sale. No, uh, uh, uh. About six months in, he goes, oh, yeah, we got our first order in Europe. I go, cool, who's it with? He goes, Phillips. I go, that's great. They're a big company. They're great. They're, you know, they're in the Netherlands. I go, how big is the deal? He goes, $20 million deal. I go, okay, man, you can hire as many guys as you want. I became noble. Hire the best people, especially if they're better than us. That's something never, ever, ever forget. And when, you, when that becomes noble, that is the magic sauce of building a company. When you take it to that level. All right, long-term goals. We, we have three. These are our three dials. And, by, and when we look at uh, these three dials, this is what determines shareholder value. Growth, profitability, and we, uh, global standard. Uh, we're amongst his room, that means market power. So, uh, and by the way, predictability is an uh, absolute key part of that. You kind of get that in the SaaS business, but uh, uh, 
in this business, it's hyper growth. It's a it's a land grab. You've got to make you've got to make money. We've been investing. We raised five hundred million dollars, and um, but you, you've got to be prof. And, and no matter what, you've got to get leverage in that business model. And then that third one is market power. So what that means is, and you measure that by market share. So your barriers to entry are huge in terms of built to last investments, um, doing things that nobody else can do, and also blocking potential new entrants. Right? So if you think of the uh, potential new entrants in our business, it's like Google and Microsoft and those guys. Now those guys are investors in us. Microsoft uses us in 350 use cases. We're the partner of the year for Office, the number one mobile application. Uh, and we have a big go-to-market with them, and they're an investor, right? So it's kind of like no guarantees in life, but that's one thing I learned is that's really important because you need to buy yourself time. For the guys you compete directly with, you go after them head on head, you out-think them, you out-focus them, you out-execute them. Because I remember, I don't know, about uh, five years ago, Adobe bought a company called EchoSign, they were a competitor for us. They had about 20 people or so. We just knocked them out of the box by out focus, out thinking them, out executing them. And then you're always worrying about the guys coming up from the bottom. For us, that's like why we made signing for free. That's why we uh, have all these APIs where the developers can uh, write right on top of the platform. And that's where we're going after reach all these users and getting a strong brand name. So. Uh, uh, getting that market power is absolutely key. Uh, and then, um, and by the way, those are the, those are the three dials that we use when we do our operating plan. So, you know, you, you're doing your annual operating plan in terms of what are your revenue and your expense and your profit targets. Sometimes we crank up the growth. Sometimes we crank up the profit, path of profitability. Sometimes we crank up the market power. So in the early days, we super cranked up the market power. Uh, and uh, so as you're working down uh, this playbook, then it's, OK, strategy. All right. Well, we hired uh, about 18 months ago one of the top CFOs in Silicon Valley. He's done four uh, IPOs, a guy named Mike Sheridan. And uh, I'll never forget, like, I think about a month after he joined, he goes, all right, we're going to hold an investor day because we've got too many investors to talk to singly. And he goes, I want you to lead off. I go, well, what do you want me to talk about? He goes, well, just four things. Uh, what is this market we're going after? Why are we winning? Why will we continue to win? And why will we be wildly profitable? And I go, didn't you forget one thing? Like, that's, that's good, right? But when you go public, they always say, hey, what's your second act? He goes, yeah, yeah, that's right. Cover those five things. I go, I can do that in one slide. He said, let's see the slide. I go, well, I got to make it first. But this is the one slide. This is what we call our leverage growth slide. We, we affectionately call it our tornado slide. So, all right, so if you look at this, anybody know what that is? It's a tornado, right? Uh, so the object of the game when you're starting from scratch, you want to achieve escape velocity. You want to whip the winds of the tornado, right? So how do you do that? You create a category, right, and the platform to go with that. We've invested $1.5 billion in the platform. Create a strong value proposition. Loyal uh, members, right, loyal partners, and create a network, right? And as you scale up, up there to the right, you're going to increase your barriers to entry on the bottom. This is tougher for anybody to compete with you or get into that business. And also, you're going to get leverage into the business model. So uh, what I'm going to show you and, uh, are the strategic chess moves that we've been following for uh, literally probably the last uh, six years. So create the category, digital transaction management. All right. Then the question is, OK, well, we go after the businesses or we go after the consumers? Well, it is, uh, we believe in the, the guy with yeah, the golden rule, the guy with the gold rule. So you go after the businesses, create a strong uh, value proposition in terms of quantifiable ROI, all that. 
and then you naturally get the consumers, right? So you think about uh, State Farm is a great customer for us. They have 70 million policyholders. Now all of a sudden we're touching all those, uh, all those consumers. The real estate market was fantastic because the real estate agents, you, and then everybody uses it to close their house, right? And then you get the viral effect between the businesses and the consumers. Then how do you turbocharge it? You turbocharge it with partners, right? Companies like IBM, companies like uh, Cisco. You know, you got SAP, Salesforce, all these guys. Microsoft. So now all of a sudden, that's really whipping the winds of the tornado. And in many cases, uh, these companies resell us, and that gets it going. So now you can see you're beginning to get leverage in that business model. Because for us, it is how do we do things more efficiently? Then when you've, when you've established yourself, you're saying, OK, can we create a standard? And uh, uh, if you think about uh, the PCI standard in payments, it sets a quality bar. Uh, for that, we did the same thing with uh, the XDTM standard. We grabbed the guy who came up with the PCI standard. He's been at Visa for 19 years, the former director of National Institute of Standards and Technology for the US government, created a board of governors of who's who, and we created this standard, which uh, sets the bar in terms of privacy, security, availability, <coughs> compliance, interoperability, universality. So you define that standard. Now you're building some serious barriers to entry. Because for somebody to get at that quality level, it's going to take a long time and a lot of money. Then that kind of creates the network effect, right? The DocuSign Global Trust Network, which is that fast, frictionless, open, secure network. Now with that, you can begin to monetize that. That's what we call our second act, right? So. With that, now all of a sudden we bring on the third party developers. That's actually over 50% of our business now, where it's really turbocharged that. Value added services, we just announced DocuSign payments uh, two weeks ago. Uh, and that is, you can sign and pay all in one easy step. Uh, and we did that in conjunction with Visa, Apple, Google, and, uh, and PayPal. And then the next future, smart contracts. Some of you guys asked some questions about that. I won't get into that, but that is um, uh, being able to parametrically uh, have smart contracts, utilize uh, blockchain, and all these new technologies for that. So that's that playbook, all boiled down execution.